Picture this. It's late August 2005. In New Orleans, families pack up their cars, highways jam with traffic, and grocery store shelves empty in hours. On TV, weather reporters stand in front of swirling satellite images that look like nature has painted a giant white pinwheel across the Gulf of Mexico. That was Hurricane Katrina, a storm that wasn't even the strongest on the Saffir-Simpson scale, but became one of the costliest natural disasters in U.S. history. So, how exactly does a storm like Katrina form out of calm blue water? At its simplest, a hurricane is a giant heat engine. The tropics soak up enormous amounts of sunlight. That heat has to go somewhere, and hurricanes are one of nature's ways of moving it toward the poles. Without storms, the equator would keep getting hotter, while higher latitudes would freeze harder. Hurricanes are destructive to us, but for the planet, they're a balancing act. Now, what's the recipe? You need four main ingredients. Warm ocean water, moist, unstable air, low vertical wind shear, and a nudge from Earth's spin. First, warm water. Hurricanes need sea surface temperatures of at least 26.5 degrees Celsius, about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And not just at the surface, the warmth must reach down about 50 meters. Think of it like fuel in a gas tank. Shallow warmth burns off too fast. Deep warmth keeps the engine running. When water evaporates, it carries latent heat. That's hidden energy locked inside water vapor. Later, when that vapor condenses into clouds, the heat is released, like unlocking an invisible battery. Second, moist, unstable air. Warm air near the surface is full of water vapor. As it rises and cools, the vapor condenses, releasing heat, which makes the air even lighter, so it rises faster faster. It's a feedback loop. Imagine popcorn popping in a pot. Once it starts, the whole pot bursts with kernels. That's how thunderstorms cluster and feed each other. Third, low wind shear. Wind shear is the change of wind speed and direction with altitude. Too much, and the storm gets ripped apart before it can organize. Hurricanes need a calm vertical column so their chimney of rising air can build skyward without being toppled. It's like trying to build a Lego tower while someone keeps bumping the table. Impossible. Fourth, Coriolis force. Because Earth spins, moving air curves to the right and the northern hemisphere to the left in the southern. This gives storms their spin. No Coriolis, no hurricane. That's why hurricanes can't form right at the equator. There's not enough spin there. Once those conditions line up, thunderstorms over the ocean start clustering. Pressure at the surface drops. Air rushes in, curving because of Coriolis, and the system begins to rotate. As it organizes, it becomes a tropical depression. Feed it more heat and moisture, and it upgrades to a tropical storm. Push further, and you get a hurricane. Inside a hurricane, the structure is jaw-dropping. At the heart is the eye, often 20 to 40 miles wide, eerily calm, sometimes even sunny. Around it, the eye wall rages with the most violent winds and rain on Earth. Here, winds can scream at 150 miles per hour in a Category 5. Spiral rain bands reach hundreds of miles outward, carrying sheets of rain and spinning off tornadoes. Altogether, a large hurricane can cover an area the size of Texas. The energy? Almost beyond imagination. A mature hurricane releases as much heat every day as 10,000 nuclear bombs. Or put another way, in its lifetime, one hurricane unleashes more energy than all the world's power plants combined. Mind. Most of that energy isn't in the wind, but in the rain, the water vapor condensing into endless sheets of downpour. That's why floods often kill more people than winds. But hurricanes are choosy about geography. That's why they're seasonal and regional. The Atlantic hurricane season runs from June to November, peaking in September, when ocean waters are hottest. The Pacific gets typhoons. The Indian Ocean sees cyclones. Different names, same physics. Now, let's zoom in on a famous case. Hurricane Harvey, 2017. Harvey stalled over Houston, moving barely two miles an hour and dumped more than 60 inches of rain, the heaviest rain event in U.S. history. That's as if an entire year's worth of rain fell in just a few days. The damage wasn't about Category 4 winds, it was about sheer water. This proves a point. A hurricane's category doesn't tell the whole story. A slow-moving weaker storm can be deadlier than a fast-moving strong one. Meteorologists have gotten better at forecasting hurricane tracks, but predicting intensity, whether a storm will stall like Harvey, explode overnight like Michael, 2018, or morph like Sandy, 2012, remains one of the toughest challenges in science. Why? Because the ocean-atmosphere interaction is incredibly complex. A shift in wind shear, a pocket of dry air, or a patch of warmer water can make or break the storm's future. And here's the new twist. Climate change. Warmer oceans mean more fuel. No Way A reports that average sea surface temperatures in the North Atlantic hit record highs in 2023, creating fears of hyperactive hurricane seasons. A study in Nature estimated that rainfall during hurricanes now increases about 10 to 15% per 1 degree Celsius of warming. Rapid intensification. The nightmare scenario 
scenario where storms jump categories in a single day has more than doubled in the last 40 years. That means less time for cities to prepare and more potential for disaster. To truly understand hurricanes, we also have to follow what happens after they form, how they evolve, why some explode into monsters, how humans can prepare, and what role they play in the larger system of Earth's climate. Once a hurricane is born, its journey takes on a life of its own. Some sputter out in days, collapsing under hostile winds or drifting into cooler seas. Others gather strength like prize fighters, feeding on the ocean's heat until they tower into monsters. These storms are dynamic, evolving systems, never static, always negotiating with the environment around them. Meteorologists use the term rapid intensification when winds jump by at least 35 miles per hour in 24 hours. That happened with Hurricane Michael in 2018. Within a single day, it transformed from a manageable storm to a beast with 155 miles per hour winds, slamming into Florida's panhandle and leveling towns. Scientists still wrestle with predicting this process. It's one of the most urgent puzzles in meteorology and about those categories. Hurricanes are ranked on the Saffir-Simpson scale from 1 to 5. Category 1 starts at 74 miles per hour, enough to take down trees and rip off shingles. Category 5 means winds above 157 miles per hour, enough to turn whole neighborhoods into rubble. But the number can mislead. Hurricane Sandy in 2012 wasn't even a Category 3 when it hit New York and New Jersey. But because it collided with a cold front, its size ballooned to nearly 1,000 miles wide, pushing a storm surge that flooded Manhattan's subway system and caused more than $70 billion in damage. Lesson, size, rainfall, and movement matter as much as wind speed. Ever heard of an eye wall replacement cycle? Picture this. The furious ring of thunderstorms around the eye gets replaced by a larger ring. For a while, the storm weakens, but once the new eye wall takes over, it often comes back stronger. Forecasting these cycles is tricky, but they can decide whether a storm batters a coast with moderate force or arrives as a wrecking ball. And then comes landfall. As soon as hurricanes hit land, they begin to weaken. They lose their fuel source, warm water. Friction from terrain breaks their circulation, but by then, the damage is already baked in. The most dangerous element is often storm surge. The dome of water hurricanes push ahead of them. Katrina's surge overtopped levees, drowning New Orleans neighborhoods. Harvey's rains submerged Houston. Sandy's surge lit up headlines from Wall Street to Staten Island. Despite their destruction, forecasting has improved dramatically. In the 1970s, predicting a storm's track three days out was shaky at best. Today, thanks to satellites, hurricane hunter aircraft, ocean buoys, and supercomputers, those forecasts are accurate within about 100 miles. That's why evacuation orders can save tens of thousands of lives. But intensity forecasting, knowing whether a storm will suddenly leap to Category 5, remains one of the toughest frontiers in science. Could humans ever tame hurricanes? The idea has floated for decades. Some suggested cloud seeding to disrupt formation. Others dreamed of pumping cold water from the deep ocean to rob storms of energy, or deploying giant bubble curtains to insulate warm seas. More recently, wild proposals include lasers or massive floating solar shields. But here's the sobering reality. A single hurricane can span hundreds of miles and release more energy than all of humanity uses in a year. Intervening at that scale isn't just impractical. It could be dangerous with unintended side effects. For now, the only realistic solution is adaptation. Better forecasting, stronger infrastructure, smarter evacuation, and adaptation works. That's why when meteorologists issue warnings, when cities call for evacuations, or when engineers push for stronger levees, it's not alarmism, it's survival. Because hurricanes aren't going away. In fact, they may be getting nastier, and the better we understand how they form, the better chance we have at living alongside them.